It's a great pleasure for an economist to be able to present his ideas uh, about the development of health care to an audience of people who will have to supply it. In attempting to forecast the cost of health care a generation in the future, several different issues have to be considered. The first of these is the likely downward trend in age-specific prevalence rates of chronic diseases and disabilities. Secondly, there is the rate of change in the cost of treating these conditions. Will advances in biotechnology reduce or increase the cost of treatment? A third issue is the likely increase in the number and proportion of the population that is elderly. And the fourth issue is the rate at which the U.S. population will increase and the sources of this increase. The fifth issue is the rate of growth of per capita income and the impact of economic growth on the, on the demand for the quantity and quality of health care. Each of these issues is so large and complex that it would take a book to address them properly. My aim in this talk today is merely to outline the issues and to sketch some tentative answers. One of the most important debates among health economists and biomedical specialists in the United States and other wealthy nations, and I'll use OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, as uh, the metaphor for rich countries, is whether rapid increase in biotechnology will spare their health systems from a financial crisis. The debate turns on four propositions. First, there is now convincing evidence that prevalence rates of chronic diseases declined during the 20th century. Second, the rate of decline in these prevalence rates has accelerated. In the American case, prevalence rates declined at a rate of about 1.0% per annum between 1910 and 1980. Between the early 1980s and 1989, they declined at a rate of 1.2% per annum. During the 1990s, the rate of decline further accelerated, reaching a level of about 2% per annum. 
Some investigators believe that a rate of decline in annual prevalence rates of 1.5 percent will be enough to offset the rising cost of health care, thus stabilizing the share of health care costs in GDP at its current level of about 16 percent. Third, there is an unresolved issue regarding how much of the decline in the, pre in, in the prevalence rates of OECD nations has been due to improvements in the environments and how much has been due to biomedical interventions. Particip part part partitioning the decline in prevalence rates into environmental effects and medical intervention effects is quite complex because of the long reach of nutrition and other biomedical insults at earlier ages on the odds of developing chronic diseases at middle and late ages. Although such life cycle effects have long been suspected in particular diseases, only recently has a substantial body of evidence bearing on the interconnections been amassed. Longitudinal studies connecting chronic diseases at maturity, middle ages and late ages, to, con <coughs> to conditions in utero, infancy, and early childhood were reported with increasing frequency beginning in the 1980s and extending through the end of the 20th century. The exact mechanism by which malnutrition and trauma at early ages affected waiting time to the onset of chronic diseases are still unclear, but it seems reasonable to infer that environmental insults during the period when cell growth is rapid could lead to long-lasting impairments of vital organs. It is important to emphasize that medical interventions have not only contributed to the decline in prevalence rates of chronic conditions, but have also reduced uh, their severity. Advances in both surgical and drug therapies have significantly reduced the rate at which chronic conditions turn into disabilities that severely impair functioning. Such interventions have been a especially effective in genitourinary, circulatory, digestive, and musculoskeletal conditions. However, many of the surgical procedures are quite expensive, and the cost of the new and more effective drugs is increasing sharply, mainly because of the large investments in developing these drugs. Fourth, there is a debate over whether the mounting evidence of the long-term decline in prevalence rates of chronic diseases means that the supply of treatable chronic diseases is, de is declining. The word supply is used here to distinguish the physiological burden of health care from the demand for health care services that may rise even if the physiological burden remains constant or declines. Moreover, to address the question of whether declines in age-specific physiological prevalence rates will relieve current fiscal pressure on the healthcare system of the OECD nations, it is necessary to weigh the existence of a particular chronic disease by the cost of treating that condition, which generally increases with age. Such an index is shown in figure one. In this figure, the burden of per capita health care costs, which is based on U.S. data, is standardized at 100 for ages 50 through 54. 
Figure one shows that the financial burden of health care per capita <coughs> rises slow. <coughs> I better take some water. Figure one shows that the financial burden <coughs> of health care per capita rises slowly in the 50s. I'm going to go back to the business school and say they make you sick in the, in the medical school. <coughs> figure, figure one shows that the financial burden of health care per capita rises slowly in the 50s, accelerates in the 60s, and accelerates again in the 70s and accelerates even more rapidly after the mid-80s. The financial burden per capita at age 85 <coughs> and, <o> <coughs> and older is nearly six times as high as the burden at, at ages 50 through 54. Notice that the financial burden of health care for ages 85 and older is over 75% higher than at ages 75 through 79. However, the physiological prevalence rates, that is the number of conditions per person, is roughly constant at ages 80 and over. Costs rise even though the number of comorbidities per person remains constant because the severity of the conditions increases or because the cost of preventing further deterioration or even partially reversing deterioration increases with age. It should be kept in mind that standard prevalence rates merely count the number of conditions neglecting both the increasing physiological deterioration with age and the rising cost of treatment per, con per condition. Figure one indicates that to forecast the future financial burden of health care, it is necessary to make use of a function of the age-specific cost of health care, such as that shown in figure one. What then can be said about the likely movements in the curve of the relative burden of health care costs over the next generation? Figure two lays out three, possible, th three possibilities. The first possibility is that there will be a proportional downward shift in the curve. That's case A in the diagram. This is the curve obtained by using the change in the average prevalence rates, which implies a shift downward at a constant average rate at all ages. The example shown in figure two implies a decline in average prevalence rates of 1.2% per annum, which reduces all of the points in case A, at about two-thirds of the previous level. If 1.5% had been used, which is the high end of current forecasts of the decline in prevalence rates, the points on the case A curve would have been located at about 60% of the original level. A second alternative shown as case B in figure two, is that the curve of the disease burden by age will shift to the right. The case B curve was constructed on the assumption that over the course of a generation, 
the average age of onset of chronic, chronic conditions is delayed by about five years. This, this assumption is supported by a number of epidemiological studies in the Netherlands, Britain, the United States, and elsewhere. This forecast is based partly on evidence that the average age of the onset of chronic disabilities has been declining since the start of the 20th century. It is also based on studies of the relative cost of healthcare by years before death. These studies have produced the curve shown in figure three, which is standardized on the average cost of health care for all persons age 65 and over in the United States Medicare program. Figure three shows that five years before the year of death, annual health care cost is virtually the same as all annual Medicare costs per capita. By the second year before death, the cost has risen by about 60%. And in the year of death, the annual cost exceeds the average by more than four times. Indeed, expenditures on persons during their last two years of life account for 40% of all Medicare expenditures. The pattern portrayed in figure three has not changed significantly over the past two decades. The relative constancy in healthcare costs by years before death supports case B in figure two because it implies that no matter how far to the right the health care curve shifts, the age-specific costs will eventually rise sharply as the proportion of, the, of persons who die in any given age category increases. This line of reasoning implies that health care costs may continue to increase even if the age of onset of chronic diseases is delayed because the proportion of a cohort living to late ages will increase. Moreover, the cost of keeping disabilities under control may rise because more effective drugs and procedures may be more expensive than the current set. Will the 21st century witness as large an increase in life expectancy of the OECD countries, that is 30 to 40 years, as occurred during the 20th century. Most experts believe it will not. The middle estimate of the, of the US Census Bureau, for example, is that the increase in life expectancy between 2000 and 2050 will only be about seven years. <coughs> and, the, <coughs> and, the, and the estimated increase for the entire 21st century is just 13 years. This is less than half the increase that occurred during the 20th century. The same conservatism is evident in the projections of the United Nations and other national and international agencies. These pessimistic projections rest on several propositions. Perhaps the most <coughs> widely accepted is the proposition that opportunities for large reductions in mortality rates are possible 
only when death rates under age five are very high. Proponents of this view, for, ex for example, argue that the sharp decline in US mortality rates during the 20th century was the result of a unique opportunity that cannot be replicated by those nations that have already experienced it. The opportunity to wipe out the majority of deaths due to acute infectious diseases, which were widely concentrated in infancy and early childhood. Whereas more than a third of all deaths at the turn of the 20th century were under age five, today infant and childhood deaths are less than 2% of the total. of the annual total. By contrast, death among persons age 65 and older, which accounted for just 18% of the total in 1900, have grown to three quarters of all deaths today. Thus, at the start of the 21st century, the argument goes, the more than 90% of birth cohorts who live to age 50 begin to suffer an increasing number of chronic diseases because their vital organ systems naturally lose their effectiveness with aging. And this deterioration will eventually increase to a point where life can no longer be sustained. Empirical observations are buttressed by a variety of theories some of them drawn from evolutionary biology as to why the cells of vital organ systems decay. One prominent theory holds that because reproduction ceases at age 50, there is a sharp rise in deaths at post-reproduction age because the forces of natural selection have not eliminated the genes that hasten rapid physiological decline past age 50. There are, however, persuasive arguments that spell out a more optimistic view of the course of change in health and longevity during the 21st century. One of these arguments is based on the projection, not of past changes in average life expectancy, but of record life expectancy since 1840. Record life expectancy is defined as the highest life expectancy experienced by any country at each point in time. For example, the record life expectancy at birth in 1840 was found among Swedish women who lived on average a little more than 45 years. In the year 2000, Japanese women achieved a record life expectancy of nearly 85 years. Fitting a curve to best practice observations over a period of 160 years yields a linear curve which suggests that for the foreseeable future, female life expectancy will increase at 2.4 years per decade, and male life expectancy will increase at 2.2 years per decade. These calculations lead to the prediction that by 2070, female life expectancy in the United States will be between 93 and 102 years, which substantially exceeds the forecast of 84 years made by the Social Security Administration in 1999. The fact is that demographers' past predictions of maximum life expectancy 
have been notoriously conservative when these forecasts were based on average experience. In the late 1920s, L.I. Dublin, the chief actuary at the Metropolitan Life Insurance Company, put a cap of 64.75 years on life expectancy for both men and women. In 1936, he collaborated with the leading mathematical demographer of the first half of the 20th century to publish a revised upper limit of 69.93 years. More recently, a leading gerontologist set an upper limit on life expectancy of 85 plus or minus seven years. Generally speaking, these caps tend to be in the range of five to 10 years beyond the observed life expectancy at the time the forecasts were published. The accelerating decline in the prevalence rate of chronic diseases during the course of the 20th century supports the proposition that increases in life expectancy during the 21st century will be fairly large. At the beginning of the 20th century, the burden of chronic diseases among elderly Americans was not only of greater severity, but began more than 10 years earlier in the life cycle than it does today. Moreover, the number of comorbidities at each age between 50 and 70 is well below levels that prevailed a century ago. This is, according to one study, equivalent to pushing back old age, since an increase of one unit in a comorbidity index is the equivalent of being a decade older. Studies of changes in functional limitations among persons who have reached age 65 since the early 1980s indicates that such limitations declined at a, an accelerating rate throughout the last two decades of the 20th century. Dora Costa, uh, an economist and biometrician at UCLA, has found that favorable changes in body size particularly the decline in waist-to-hip ratio, a measure of abdominal fat, explain close to half of the decline in mortality rates above age 65 during the course of the 20th century. Taking account of the characteristics of men of military age in 1988, she predicts that the annual decline in male mortality rates after age 65 will be nearly twice as high between 18, 1988 and 2022 as it was between 1914 and 1988. Overall, the work on trends in chronic diseases and on frame sizes tends to support forecasts of continued linear trends in the extension of longevity during the 21st century. One factor arguing in support of the optimistic projections is the increasing span of years that individuals have free of chronic conditions. For those who reached age 65 during the first decade of the 20th century, the average age of onset of disabilities was about age 51. By the 1990s, however, the average age of onset of chronic diseases was more than 10 years later. Moreover, these disabilities are generally milder and many effective interventions to reduce the impact of chronic conditions are available. The outlook for new 
and more effective technologies to deal with chronic disabilities. Through the marriage of biology and microchip technology is very promising. Indeed, some devices that combine living cells and electronics to replace failed organs are already at the stage of human trials. Somewhat further off, but even more promising, are advances in genetic engineering that hopefully will produce cures for what are now untreatable diseases. Why is it that although the average age of onset of disabilities has been delayed by 10 years, and that these disabilities have become milder than they used to be, that the share of GDP spent on health is rising. One factor is the increase in the proportion of the population that is elderly. However, such changes in age structure account for a minor part of rising expenditures on the order of 10%. The main factor is the long-term income elasticity of the demand for health care, which is 1.6. That is, for every 1% increase in a family's income, the family wants to increase its expenditures on health care by 1.6%. This is not a new trend. Between 1875 and 1995, the share of family income spent on food, clothing, and shelter declined from 87% to just 30%, despite the fact that we eat more food, own more clothes, and have better and larger homes today than we had in 1875. All of this has, made, has been made possible by the growth in the productivity of traditional commodities. In the last quarter of the 19th century, it took 1,700 hours of labor to purchase the annual food supply for a family. Today, it requires just 260 hours, and it is likely that by 2040, a family's food supply will be purchased with about 160 hours of labor. Consequently, there is no need to suppress the demand for health care. Expenditures on health care are driven by demand, which is spurred by income and by advances in biotechnology that make health interventions increasingly effective. Just as, the last, just as electricity and manufacturing were the industries that stimulated the growth of the rest of the economy at the beginning of the 20th century, healthcare is the great growth industry of the 21st century. It is a leading sector which means that expenditures on health care will pull forward a wide array of other industries, including manufacturing, education, financial services, communication, and construction. Thank you very much. to look at, say, the, 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 t the top 1% in the develop, most developed nations, the 1% that live the longest, yeah. has that been increasing at a, their, their life expectancy? Yeah, at about 1% per annum. Life expectancy at age 90 has been increasing at 1% per annum for 50 years and shows no signs of uh, that uh, rate of increase or rate of decrease in the, in the death rate at age 90 shows no signs of petering out. The outlook is very good.
uh, I expect my grandchildren to have a median length of life of over 100 years. Thank you. You uh, began with an analysis of environmental factors on reducing chronic uh, health burden as largely salutary. I think using nutrition as a potential uh, example there. Is there a reason and a signal as yet to think that that effect may have become maximal and now is deteriorating as people move in the direction of another form of malnutrition, which is to say obesity, uh, and its effects on chronic health conditions? And I could imagine similar environmental effects having been maximal and now deteriorating. Uh. I should tell you that I disagree with the uh, NIH standards for uh, the definition of obesity or overweight, anyhow. Uh, uh, in my work, I find that the optimal uh, weight at uh, Average height, because the optimal weight is not independent of average height, is a BMI of 26, which is within the level of overweight in NIH standards. And I think uh, the reason I think that my estimates are better than theirs is because their mathematical curve fitting is not very sophisticated. You'll forgive me. And I hope the NIH will forgive me and will continue to support my research. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Professor, does it make a difference uh, to your estimates whether or not the funding for health care is accomplished uh, primarily by transfer payments or is uh, a function of individual household determinations to spend money? Does, it, does that seem to play a role in the uh, income elasticity and what kind of effect do you think this would have on planning for health care uh, funding over the next 20 years? Uh, could you repeat the question? I'm not sure I got it all. What is the impact of transfer payments on this growth of health care spending? And does it make a difference to your calculations whether or not uh, health care spending comes primarily through transfer payments is purchased by individuals. What's a transfer payment? Uh, a payment, I take it by transfer payment, you mean a government yes. subsidy to some groups. Well, we've always had subsidies for the poor. Uh, in the 19th century, it was done mainly through private organizations, churches, and uh, other charit charitable organizations. The government did not take responsibility for these things until well after World War II. Uh, uh, there, for the very poor, there will have to continue to be transfer payments, whether it's worked out through government or private auspices. And uh, there are ways in which the government transfer payments can be pretty efficient, that is, can be done at, at a very low cost. Uh, the best example of efficiently run transfer payments is Social Security. That is a, a very efficient operation. The, the average uh, cost is only about 1%, which is better than most private insurance companies do. Their, their costs are in the neighborhood of 2 to 5%. I don't know if, if that's an adequate answer. Is there something more that you'd like me to comment on? In particular, the question about the average um, life expectancy and its role in um, determining health care costs seems to depend upon um, uh, not the account of the variance here, which seems to be very wide across populations in uh, countries like the United States. 
versus other countries that have advanced healthcare systems, for instance, Sweden. So the question would be, is, is the expectation of an average or median uh, increase in life expectancy uh, going to actually gain the same for all population, for all members of the population? What's the variance that's going to be, and is that going to increase? Well, we spend much more per capita than any country in the world. Uh, much more than Sweden does. And that's because we're richer. I mean, Sw Swedish per capita income is only about three quarters of US per capita income. So you have to factor in that issue that I raised in my talk, that for every 1% increase in income, families want to increase their expenditures on health care. Uh, we, we <laughs> in, in 19, uh, in 2001, my wife and I attended the 100th anniversary of the Nobel Prize in Stockholm, and my wife came down with uh, a cold. By the time we got to London, about 10 days later, the cold had turned into pneumonia. And uh, I took my wife to the emergency room of guys in St. Thomas's Hospital, which is probably the best research hospital in London. It's right across from Parliament. And they immediately diagnosed her. They listened. They said, you have pneumonia. And they took her in. They put her on Cipro, and which took care of the problem. If it had been in the United States, they would have listened to her and say, well, we think you have pneumonia, but just to be careful, let's take an x-ray. <laughs> so we, we spend a lot of money on uh, discovering whether there is something beyond which you can hear with a stethoscope that may be an issue in this uh, problem. When they got her up, there was only one telephone. They, uh, all the patients were in wards, about 20 beds to a ward. One telephone per ward. Can anybody ima imagine an American getting well without a telephone beside <laughs> their bed? No TV. Absolutely no TV. In an American hospital, you not only expect TV, but at least 40 channels. <laughs> we need to have choice. So we have a lot of luxury elements. Uh, we, and I don't buy the view that it's excessive, that it's pushed by uh, mercenary people in the healthcare system. I think it's driven by consumer demand. We just like all of these things. We want to be pampered. We want to make sure, and we, by checking and rechecking results. And I think as the European countries reach our level of, of wealth, they will be doing what we're doing. We did not buy all of this superfluous uh, testing when we were only two-thirds of our current level, yes. I thought I heard you say at the end that there was, you felt there was no need to restrain the cost of health care. And is that because we're rich enough to afford it? Yeah. We're continuing to get richer? Yes. Not only that, but I think that health care is what I call a growth industry or a leading sector. The demand generated within health care creates demand for uh, products in a wide range of other industries. So healthcare is helping to push. Look, suppose I told you that people were buying twice as many cars. Would you get upset? Or would you say, terrific, look how our industrial sector is booming. Forget about Japanese competition. But for some reason, we treat healthcare differently. We shouldn't. It's the largest industry in the economy now. 
It's bigger than manufacturing. Manufacturing is only 14% of the economy. Healthcare is 16%, and my forecast is that by 2040, it will be 29% of the economy. Did you say that in your talk? Uh, I published it. I, 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 I don't think I said it in this talk, but I published that number. Yeah, yes. Um, do you see any problem, though, in, in the vast majority of that money being spent at the very end of people's lives? I mean, well, one problem is it's hard to tell when the very end is. <laughs> He's a geriatrician. Uh, <laughs> I don't want somebody to prematurely decide I'm dying. <laughs> Well, I think if we were, if we, uh, if we had a pipeline to God, we'd know that, that that's not true. Otherwise, you're talking about odds. And you're saying, well, in 82% of the, ca that's a made up number. When people have this thing, they're not going to come out of it. Uh, I think that individual should make that decision, not, not the government. I don't think it should be. Uh, I mean, in my own family, we had issues of when to pull the plug. And I, I have a living will that says I don't want uh, extraordinary methods to be used. Uh, but there's, there's a gray area in between where uh, interventions may be effective. You may be able to extend reasonable quality of life uh, for months or years. And uh, I wouldn't want to deprive people of that opportunity. I would not want a committee making that decision. Uh, my brother, uh, who was six years older than me, nine years ahead of me in school and was all my life my hero, uh, had a, uh, a massive stroke. And uh, We called around to lots of friends all over the country, it, physicians, and asked them, uh, you know, what we ought to do. Should we keep him on? And most of the friends told us that if it was their brother, they would have pulled the plug, that he wasn't going to come out of it. But I really think only the family should make, should make that decision. And most people, I think, will make reasonable decisions on that. There, there is no point seeing a loved one in a coma being kept alive by machines. I've had lots of friends who've had to make that decision about loved ones. And uh, from my point of view, they've all made appropriate decisions. So I don't think we need a government committee supervising that. Yeah. Is, doesn't it change things given the fact that with Medicare being the payor for virtually all of those things, not all, but virtually all of them, that is the cost of it is something that the family will not face. Um, doesn't that give some weight to the idea that there should be a public political judgment about in what sorts of situations those resources should be used. Since the public is going to have to pay for it but with the public coffers. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to have TIA crap pay for it, let people buy insurance. I mean, people pay for Medicare through taxes. Uh, 
I would prefer if a committee was going to make the decisions, I would pr prefer to buy my insurance privately so that a committee doesn't make that decision, that my insurance. I don't think most people, uh, I mean, there, there are rare cases where people uh, have kept individuals in coma on uh, for years. And there are also a few rare cases in which they've come out of the coma and made reasonable recoveries. Those, those sort of things are so way out in the spectrum of possibilities that they're not an economic issue. They're only a good newspaper story. Uh, from an economic point of view, I don't think most people will, will uh, say, gee, it's, it's free, Let, let's keep him on the machine. You know, there's another cost. There's a cost in family trauma. There's a cost in time lost by the loved ones who are taking time off from their jobs and so on. So there are a lot of forces that work towards uh, not prolonging. I don't have the figures, but it'd be interesting to see uh, Uh, if you look at people who are not on Medicare, whether the average duration of keeping them going is different than if they are on Medicare. I really think that the, the non-insurance aspects of it, the costs, exceed the insurance costs from a family's point of view. You've made many of us in the audience very happy when you talk about <coughs> Healthcare being the growth industry in the 21st century. When you talk about uh, increasing from 16% to 29% over the next 30 years, uh, the amount of uh, healthcare uh, expenditures. Uh, and, um, but probably no one in the audience is happier than Mr. Bernstein, uh, who's sort of in the middle of this. Robert, what, what, what do you make of a 29%? Uh, of the GDP going to healthcare. Well, we have to spend our money on something. <laughs> That's exactly it. I mean, how many, how many more? We have more radios than we have ears. There's just the limit to how many uh, pieces of, of hardware you can accumulate. Do you want to have two TVs in every room? Is it one enough? So uh, I, mean, I, I think you're absolutely right. The, the, uh, to put it in economist language, the income elasticity of these sort of hard goods is relatively low. If you talk about food, it's 0.2. If you talk about consumer durables, it's about 0.6. If you talk about housing, it's about 0.8, but it's all less than one, which means a 1% increase in income leads to less than an equal increase in expenditures, but in healthcare, it leads to 1.6% for exactly the, what else are we gonna spend it on? We have, by the way, two cars per household. How many cars can you have? What are you gonna go? Into the car collecting, <laughs> hobby? The other, the other thing I would say, Mark, uh, point uh, Professor Fogel made is that um, uh, while healthcare, when you think about 29% uh, of the GDP being healthcare, healthcare is both in the numerator and in the denominator. Uh, and so, uh, I mean, I use the example frequently when not cars, but when Boeing sells more planes, um, we don't say that planes are becoming too great a share of the gross national product, or that personal computers are too great a share of the gross national product, because it in fact expands the gross national product as well. Good. Well, I think I, I will call today's session to an end and, and thank Professor Provo so much.